Hi guys, I'm back and a lot of new videos coming. We're gonna talk about how companies who make plugins trick you, why you don't get top results using your favorite plugins, and we're gonna have honest talk how exactly you choose plugins based on what. I remind you that these videos on this channel is just light entertaining addition to one of the most serious audio production course, where we compare your projects with top sounding mixes of all time. It's a nine months in Skype. It's very crafted system. I've been teaching hundreds of students during the last seven years. You are welcome to attend one free trial class with current students to see exactly how we learn. On the screen you can see how to send a request to attend trial class. By the way, I donate the whole income from this YouTube channel to help cats and dogs, so while you're watching this video, you actually help cats and dogs. And this channel was ranked as the second best channel on YouTube in 2019 on the subject of audio production. So today I really want to make it really honest and straightforward, you know, because I feel you guys, and when I started 20 years ago, I went through the same issues with plugins as you going through right now. If you're curious, by the way, I call myself top ranked audio engineer, you can read the first second of this video, there is a text which explains my path, what I went through. I, th I thought I just need to find great tools for audio production, the best from the best plugins, and then my mixes will be great. And you get trapped. You angry, you feel yourself confused, because you struggle with plugins all the time. You try to do the best possible, you really invest your time in it, but you struggle and struggle, and you commonly blame your plugins. You say, oh my god, probably this tool is not so good, I need to find some better plugin. You compare your favorite mixes uh, to your songs, and it never sounds the same, and you say, oh my god, what I should buy? Every plugin manufacturer says, is the most authentic plugin, is the biggest kind of a plugin company in the world, they engage so known audio engineers and all these audio engineers say in those advertisements, they say, is the best plugins, the best plugins, it's like real thing, and you say, oh my god, I want it, I want it, so you buy and buy and buy, right? It's exactly what happens. They all say this phrase, a legendary device, legendary device, platinum albums, platinum albums, Grammy winning audio engineers, Grammy winning audio engineers, and you say, damn, I really should get all these plugins. By the way, pretty soon I will upload the video where I compare real analog devices. I'm gonna be comparing SSL channel strip. I have $6,000 SSL channel strip, as you can see, over here, over there on the top. We will compare six or seven different plugins from Brainworks, Universal Audio, Wave, SoftTube. I mean, pretty all known SSL emulations. And instead of like subjective kind of tone, what you hear, I really gonna show you if it's really the same or not. So don't miss it, it will be pretty cool. But don't get me wrong, I don't mean plugins are bad or something like that. Actually, even having analog stuff, I still stick with plugins. Actually, they're my favorite tools and actually I'm mixing in the box nowadays. My point is, very skilled audio engineer can make a perfect mix, even with bad plugins, you know, subjective what is bad plugin, but with your bad plugins, they can make perfect mix. Because they work on audio, they don't work with commercials, they analyze waveform, they consider three main things in audio, amplitude, phase, and frequency, and based on it, they make it perfect. Uh, most people use plugins like with presets or, or by suggestions of some known audio engineers, they just apply something and it just simply doesn't sound good. Or just sometimes sound good, but sometimes not, you know. So the point is, skilled audio engineer can make perfect mix with bad plugins, while medium skilled audio engineer can make pretty bad mix using so-called so the best plugins. For example, you have recording, right? You already track the song or it's an electronic beat, you converted it to audio and it's ready to be mixed. You want to have a compressor in your sound. If you didn't know, compressors actually like equalizers as well, because some compressors can emphasize upper mid-range, some compressors may emphasize some warmth and like smoothness, bottom end, they suppress transients, it may be like soft knee and long release, so it makes your sound like fat and with a lot of density, like darker sometimes, they put additional harmonics, let's say in the low mid, and you consider those compressors like fat sounding compressors. So the problem is, uh, imagine this situation, if your original waveform was muddy and dark, and you apply this compressor which emphasizes fatness and warmth and low mid, you actually will emphasize muddiness, and you will make your sound even darker and muddier in the mix. And you say, oh my god, I don't like this compressor, based on just one song, which just coincidentally makes your sound muddier, and then you say, I don't like this plugin. You choose the other plugin, let's say plugin, I don't like it, it's muddy, 
and you choose Y plugin, which is brighter, more transparent. Some plugins can emphasize upper mid range. It can tighten up low frequencies. Let's say you process the kick. Your kick was muddy. You made this kick tighter and you say, yes, this is better drum compressor. I like it on the kick. The problem is in the other mix where you, where you're going to have like thin sound in kick, you don't have enough density. It sounds more like tee, tee, you know, like instead of like, tee. and you apply this tight sound in compressor, which emphasize highs and upper mid range even more. And you say, Oh my god, now I don't like this compressor on the kick. So there is no better compressor here, you know. Each compressor can be suitable to some sounds and not suitable to other sounds. Even if now you say, okay, I will compensate with the EQ, but you know what? Each equalizer can modify your sound differently. It can modify your face in the worst way. Even sometimes you may have specific equalizer curves or coloration of EQ, which actually can spoil the situation even more. So companies tell you LA-2A is one of the greatest vocal compressor ever existing in the history. Uh, let's say LA-2A gray, but it has like medium release, you know. And the problem is if you apply it, let's say, on a very fast sounding vocal, let's say hip hop vocal where you have many short notes, your compressor may create so-called too long residual compression. So long note has some impulse and the tail which is lasting and fading out slowly. Then the next note happens and it goes like this. On some revisions of LA-2A, it may be shorter, on some LA-2As it can be longer. If you have pretty long release, gain reduction meter and compression process itself, right? They dive deeply like this, and then they start to go to the surface trying to stop making compression, trying to stop making this volume drop. Compressor causes volume drop, it makes some notes quieter, some peaks quieter. So it has this reduction process. So when it goes up, it may be like uh, finishing not too far away from the beginning of the next note and it will be perfect kind of compression for this type of vocal. But what if you apply the same compressor, but you apply it on much faster voice? Let's say your voice has something like this. You have short notes, first note, second note, third note, fourth note, fifth note, like this. And you still have the same release curve, so it goes back to the surface. Not even passing half of the way, it, it meets the next note, the second note, should trigger its own compression. If note is too loud, compressor compresses more. If uh, note is quiet, compressor may compress it much less, but instead of considering note itself, it has to apply unfinished compression from the previous note. Let's say you compress first note by 10 dB and second note will be compressed by 5 dB automatically. Not even considering its own compression, it will already have 5 dB from the previous note. And that's why your note still may be floating, some notes will be too loud, too quiet, your compressor is too slow. It cannot consider each note independently, it's all the time kind of a has to compress the next note because of the previous note. A way with a faster response will be more suitable, or any other compressor with a short release. But again, release curve can be different, release curve can have, like, concave curve or convex curve, you know, it can be like this and like this, it can affect on what you hear differently. Instead of like trying to find the best plugin for the vocal, you'd, you'd better learn what you should understand in the vocal, what kind of parameters may affect on a good result and bad result, uh, how to hear those things, because I'm sure not a lot of people really can realize what they hear. This is what we learn on my course, for example. I really train people how to make decisions, what to listen to to make decisions, you know, what to recognize in audio and how some of your movements really affect on other instruments in a bad way sometimes. You, you can improve one instrument but it can mask the sound of the other instrument. So all these little relations in audio, this is what we call audio engineering intuition. You think about balance, not about what plugin is better, or how some famous audio engineers set up their plugins, or analog gear. It's all cool, it's all interesting to find out what other people do, but you know what? In the end of the day, it's all about your particular mix and exactly relations and different frequencies in your particular mix. And if you cannot handle it, it's a big problem. For example, you go to some website, you know, let's say Universal Audio website, and you check, for example, I actually like Universal Audio, don't get me wrong, I use Universal Audio, I have majority of these plugins, you know. I like them, I use them a lot, but I mean check prices, right? Bill Putnam, $176, $300. $25 zero compressor, $300. Distressor, $300. Like uh, Lexicon, $350. I really can spend like three or four thousand dollars on Universal Audio. I may have spent actually. The problem is a lot of people think like this, I will buy everything I need and then I really gonna work. 
The problem is it never happens like this because the same companies or new companies appear on the market and they start to claim, no, finally, we are the most authentic plugins. And new plugins, even from the same plugins company like Softube or Universal Audio, they say, we actually improved our modeling techniques and you start to invest in those plugins again. You always will be collecting and investing in plugins more and more and more and more. Nothing wrong with having a lot of plugins. I have a lot of plugins. I have... I don't know, like hundreds of plugins, to be totally honest, from pretty any plugin manufacturer. But it doesn't mean I really need all those plugins. On my course, we learn topics. And related to each topic, we have a lot of different analog equipment and plugins which emulate this analog equipment. And to be totally honest, they all sound different. Each SSL emulation will sound different from Brainworks, from Universal Audio, from Waves, from Softube. They all sound different. And you must know this difference. You really should understand what's the difference really and where it's more suitable. We learn absolutely each plugin. We learn all their nuances. We understand in what cases those plugins can be suitable or not suitable, why this plugin may be better in this situation or this plugin plugin can be better in this situation, and why some settings sometimes work and sometimes not. We even have homeworks where you choose any plugins you want, and then I check in real time your homeworks. I don't prepare myself to say something, I really show you how I work. So I mean like real time intuition, how I make decisions, what I consider, I comment every my movement, I explain not just what I do, I explain why I do it. This plugin, maybe it's okay over here, but look how this plugin spoils the other instrument and why, what to listen to. So we do it in real time. Uh, while we're doing it, we compare your songs to the best sounding mixes of all time. No, we really compare one thing and the other and I cannot trick you in this case, because I really show you how the perfect mix sounds and how your mix sounds. I can only improve your mix to bring it closer to the, to the best sounding mix ever. All about results. So this is the most difficult, like for the teacher, but it's the most useful type of the course for the student. You can choose you even your own projects. You can choose any genres you want. I can provide projects. You can forget about homeworks. Let's say if you don't want to show your homeworks, you can attend classes for explanation for stuff. I myself show a lot of examples. Instead of spending thousands thousands and thousands of dollars on plugins, my students learn every plugin in advance, even before they buy something, I explain all nuances of each plugin, and they realize that this plugin may be suitable for them, this plugin may be not suitable for them, in what cases it can be suitable. Basically, they save thousands of dollars. And what's the most important, they improve their audio production skills. Instead of being shopaholics, they start to be audio engineers. Sometimes manufacturers say, this plugin is suitable for drums, bass, vocal, instruments, and I say, what? Are you kidding me? Like, so it's basically suitable for everything, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, maybe it's not suitable for the vocal, maybe my vocal requires something else. Or sometimes they say it's suitable for EDM or like rock. Do you even realize what kind of bullshit it is? Plugin actually can be suitable for everything when it's suitable to the waveform. Plugin may have specific curves on equalizers or releases working with transients for the, for the sustain of notes. It's suitable for hip hop. And I say, what? So if it's suitable for hip hop, what it means? It's like, it's not suitable for country. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just, sometimes I just feel like plugin manufacturers just simply don't know what to say about their plugins, or they just simply don't realize where exactly this plugin can be suitable. It's suitable for hip hop, EDM, it's suitable for drums, bass, and vocal. Reload engineering, where you really think about aspects of waveforms. Why you should think like, if it's for drum or if it's like for country, you know. <laughs> customers put some reviews and most of those reviews sounds like this i bought it and i like it if it's a good review it's difficult to say i'm more kind of curious if it keeps density of your sound you know some compressors make your instruments like more hollow some compressors they can make your low mid like with more density they can saturate low mid a lot instead of like uh, it sounds more like uh, you know like like more density, more concentrated low mid. I always curious if a compressor is too noisy, if it's open, if it's like more polishing, if it's dark sounding, if it's bright sounding. This is more important than just hearing from somebody, how about this plugin? Oh, I like it. <laughs> you know, 
you know, even all these monitors, they show you different things. Some monitors may not reveal, let's say, sharpness of your sound. Most modern monitors sound very smooth, and you believe that you hear it in one way, but some people who just gonna check your song, let's say, on a cell phone speaker, or on, like, bright sounding monitors without too much response from the bottom end, may consider your instruments too spiky, too sharp, too annoying. You know, you play electric guitar, it sounds very smooth and warm, and you say, oh my god, I like the tone. But your monitor simply cannot reveal will this kind of a spiky let's say 2k 2.5k and it's so ear piercing on some speakers but you just don't don't notice it so it's all about audio intuition honestly to be totally honest i don't want to sound like criticizing something or something like that i really wish you to understand audio like audio not like go quickly and buy my new plugin because it's the most authentic you know it's just it's just not what you really need in audio production. So all this monitoring topic we cover on our course as well. We have studio setup topic. Very kind of cool and huge topic. I reveal so a lot of myths of audio production. We learn how to set up room, what monitors to choose, what headphones, to, what to consider. Uh, what's the difference between, let's say, balance of loud early reflections and quiet late reflections. Or quiet early reflections and loud late reflections. So you learn acoustics, you realize... Uh, you understand the whole physics of the process. A lot of people, for some reason, believe that uh, listening skills is something what is given to you by default. It's not. It's like everything in our life. We should train it. You cannot shoot three-pointers in basketball, like hitting 20 from 20, just by default. Your body, your hands could do it, but you should train it. The same with your ears. You really should train your ears. And this is what I do exactly on the course. I all the time train your ears and ability to hear and ability to make decisions. I remember a video from one YouTube channel on related to electric guitars. Guitar sounded awful. And people started to put in comment section like complaints, it's awful guitar, or some people say, no, it's an amplifier. I instantly recognized the issue. It was their room mic, they had a, a microphone on the ceiling. And it, this microphone was used like a room mic. And this microphone is actually very sensitive. It's not suitable for very loud sound in amplifiers. And it was clipping in the room mic. So it just proves people cannot even recognize the difference between sound of a guitar and sound of ambience. They cannot recognize sound of clipping. What we are talking about then, when we start to say about these little differences between plugins. In plugins is so much subtle than in that example. But majority of people couldn't know what was the reason of that bad sound. It just proves you should train your ability to listen to. For example, people buy Waves plugins. Later, people start to say something like, no, Waves sound fizzy, all their plugins sound similar. Then Steven Slade plugins appear on the market and people say, no, finally, we have better company, we have better plugins. After like five years, people already don't say this about Steven Slade plugins. Something new comes to the market and people start to say, no, now we finally have more authentic plugin. I mean, believe me, you will spend thousand dollars playing in this game. No point. And believe me, there is no perfect plugins. Each plugin has disadvantages. On the course, I never force students to like or love some specific plugins. I don't say them. Use this, because this is better. I absolutely understand that there is different style of mixing. Students may make their own decisions what they like more. For example, they may activate demo modes, they pass through some homeworks. I really see that some plugins they choose, it's really not suitable for them, and people simply don't buy those plugins, they buy more suitable for their style of mixing plugins. Honestly, we learn so a lot of stuff which my own invention, or stuff which you really don't find on the internet, and learning all this stuff really reveal all these little issues. Let's say some student all the time has issues with opening sound, right? Let's say some people like mix like that, you know, their mixes always sound dark, so probably these guys would prefer to use a bit, let's say, brighter compressors. No matter if it's a reverb topic, delay topic EQs, compressors, deessers, limiters, mastering, uh, master limiters, master equalizers, multiband, sidechain, parallel compression, uh, you know, you name it. So any other topics you, you learn on this course, I show you all possible plugins related to this particular topic. Every person should find their own collection of plugins because it's always very personal thing. So, how you can say, these are seven the best compressors for EDM in 2019. Nowadays, you can find million websites on the internet like that. Just put in Google search, the best seven DSers, the best seven limiters for EDM in 2019. I understand, people who make these websites, uh, they want tra traffic for their website. I understand that, no problem with that. But honestly, you better learn. 
skills, ability to hear, make decisions, understanding physics behind the process, instead of just listening what plugin to buy. On the course we have 80% related to mixing and mastering anyway, but we have a lot of different important topics, like sound design, microphones, preamps, uh, you know, like post-production, music writing, arrangement, all these things we actually cover, and it's cool, because when I created my course seven years ago, I wanted to craft absolutely kind of the best possible education system which covers all aspects of audio where you come in out from this from this course like a guru of audio. So we have microphones on this course and for example over here in front of you you have Flea Vintage 47. It's a Flea Vintage 47 microphones. Pretty expensive tube microphone, right? Based on classic U47 style microphones. You can, can you say the difference between this microphone and Telefunken, let's say, U47? Not like I like it more. I mean, without this bullshit, can you say really what's the difference and at least in what cases Flea will be working better or in what cases Telefunken will be working better? What exactly you should consider? What kind of little nuances you must consider to really decide which microphone in what cases can be more suitable? We learn all this stuff on the course. You always should know what happens if you change this microphone, let's say, to C12. What exactly will happen to your sound? I know in advance what happens. I feel it intuitively what happens with audio if I change this microphone to, let's say, C12. What kind of C12? Modern AKG C12 or older C12? What happens if you change this microphone to Rode K2? What will happen with your sibilances? What will happen with your mids? What about saturation levels? Where is the sweet spot? Each microphone may work differently with preamplifier. You may have your favorite preamplifier, but one microphone works with the lower levels on your preamp better in terms of overall tone. Other microphones requires a bit more cranked preamplifier levels. This is what you should think about all the time when you consider any equipment, plugin, microphone, preamplifier, instead of just like, I like it, or it's a legendary tool, or Grammy winning audio engineer likes it. <laughs> Very last thing. Reviews of professional audio engineers. You go to any plugin they offer you, and under this plugin, some famous guys say something like, I tried it and I like it. You wouldn't believe I've really seen recently this famous guy say, I tried it on the bass and I liked it. In, in your song maybe you, you like it, but in the next song it may be not working for you based on those things I explained. Like it can be bright sounding compressor for your already too thin and bright sounding instrument, so it will not be suitable or something like that. So secondly, to review something you really should take time to really experiment with. I was official tester for SSL doing the bundle, right? When I was official tester, it wasn't like just, do you like it or not? No, it was like many different songs. You should try it on different instruments. You really should realize how it works, if all parameters work properly. If some famous guy try a plugin, it, it really doesn't mean anything because they just try it on one song in some one particular instrument and they say, yeah, I like it. You know, it's not really review. Review is when you had this plugin for for a year. You still use it. You use it all the time on many instruments. You use it in every your mix for some specific reasons why this plugin is better than the other plugins. You should explain reasons why this plugin you prefer more than other plugins for what reasons. But instead they just say, I like it. This plugin just appeared on the market, right? It's a new plugin. It was released yesterday, and it, this plugin already has reviews of professionals. It probably was like this. This plugin company offered these guys to review this plugin. These guys said, okay, because it's a promotion for these audio engineers as well, because people will see their names. These audio engineers may find clients in this way. Plus, their name all the time mentioned, so they keep their popularity in this field, right? So this is why everybody is interested to say something about something on the internet. This is how the market works. Some plugin manufacturers come to you and say, hey, we, we so respect you, and you say, yeah, I like you too, I respect your plugins, so let's make a review, let's make it. And suddenly you say, I don't like it, I don't like it. <laughs> it's just simply impossible, you know. So be aware. To summarize the point of this video, it's all about skills. It's all about understanding audio. Invest in your skills instead of just buying a bunch of plugins. Those little things should come together, you know. You really should realize, like, every your movement, how it affects us in terms of improvement and how it makes other things worse in the mix, because every movement actually can be harmful in mixing. And actually, your skills will tell you what plugins you need. It's so easy to 
understand what plugins to buy when you have already skills. Just if you're interested, you can uh, send me a request uh, on the screen, you can see how to do it. You can attend one free trial class fully for free to see real classes with current students. This course is relatively affordable. For the same amount of money, you can buy only one microphone, one pair of like standard monitors or three, four, five plugins. But those purchases absolutely don't guarantee you any results. It can be just like, you bought it and what, you know? This course guarantees top results, especially if you will be serious student, like investing your intention in it. You will say, yes, I want to learn it. You will be doing exactly uh, what this course teaches you. I guarantee top results. I guarantee it. So you're welcome to attend free trial class. Videos will be coming on this channel probably one time per two weeks. See you later. Subscribe. Don't forget bell notification.